I want to give you some background on this masterclass series. First, about me. I've worked with the FBI and the CIA, U.S. Supreme Court, the White House. I've been a presidential appointee at the Department of Justice. And all the while, I was seeing that the methods used for keeping public officials safe, those methods could be used by regular people, and usually women, because a public figure in America was killed about once every six years, but a woman in America was killed by a husband or boyfriend about once every six hours. So I took two years off work and I wrote a book called The Gift of Fear, expecting that it might help some people. I did not expect it to become the number one bestseller in America and Canada. I didn't expect it to be published in 25 languages. I didn't expect Oprah Winfrey to do a bunch of shows about the concepts in the book. This book could save your life. The Gift of Fear remained the best-selling book in the world on violence, and it still is today. A quick word about pronouns. Men, at all times in history, at all ages, and in all parts of the world, are more violent than women. And for this reason, the language I use is often gender-specific to men. Politically correct would be statistically incorrect. So please understand my frequent stories in which men were the aggressors. Now, when Oprah decided to do a show commemorating the 10th anniversary of The Gift of Fear, that gave me an idea to go back and revisit the people and the concepts in the book. And for years now, we've been filming a masterclass series we did something I had never considered before. I invited people to come to our secret headquarters. We'd never had outsiders here. We came to learn that even with people randomly selected, every single participant had had a profound experience of violence. And I expect this would be true of any gathering of 18 women in America. A 19th woman who was scheduled to attend, April Jace, canceled at the last moment. And a few weeks later, we learned that she was shot and killed by her husband in front of their two sons. It was a reminder about spousal violence that none of us needed. Spending day after day with these 18 people, remarkable things happened in the room. One woman realized right then and there that her father had killed her mother. For another woman, the memories of a rape that had occurred when she was a teenager came flooding back. She had never discussed it with anyone before, and she told us the story. One woman was still in a relationship with a man who'd been violent with her, and five other attendees, who had all gotten away from violence, offered her support. We filmed discussions that I had with Amy Poehler. What is this place? And Lena Dunham and Sarah Silverman. Why? Because women in comedy often say the most prohibited things, and they have something to teach the rest of us about personal power. Plus, Amy and Lena and Sarah also each had experiences of victimization. A few of the segments were directed by Mike Myers. Yes, that Mike Myers. Why? Because Mike has two daughters and he believes in the gift of fear. And two, I'm In these classes, you'll meet a woman whose daughter was killed in the Newtown school shooting, a man who accidentally shot and killed his young brother when he was 12 years old a woman whose daughter was murdered by her boyfriend. You'll meet experts from the LAPD and the FBI, and you'll meet Marsha Clark, who's prosecuted O.J. Simpson and lots of other people who victimized women. No matter how sophisticated a predator might be, you'll see that they fail often, and your mission is to be on the better side of these dangerous transactions. The first step is to be the best informed participant. At the end of these classes, you're going to know a great deal about how to stay safe from violence. And you'll have learned directly from people who prevailed, myself included. I was standing in a hallway off to the side, watching two people in the living room of a house. And it was a woman holding a gun, aiming at her husband. And she was saying over and over again, this time I'm really gonna kill you. As I had many times already in my life, I had the responsibility to determine if this was about to be a homicide. The man had his hands up like this as if he could stop bullets. And uh, I thought, I hope he doesn't try to rush her because that might cause her to shoot him. And I watched these two people exchange signals. There was one huge one, which was that she pulled the hammer back on the gun. But in fact, that wasn't the signal that mattered to me the most. What happened next is that she took a few steps back from him. And that was the warning sign for me that there was going to be a shooting. 
because a handgun is not an intimate weapon and people like to distance themselves. I quickly turned and I went down a hallway, past a dinner that was cooking and burning on the kitchen stove, don't care, past another bedroom that had people in it, don't care. There was a two-year-old child in the last bedroom. My intention was to take her out of the house out the back door, but just as I got to the bedroom door, I heard the first shot that I just predicted. And then I heard a whole bunch more shots. The little girl who'd been asleep sat up in bed. She was shocked by the sound, but at two years old, she didn't know anything about what was happening. She couldn't weigh the gravity of what was going on. But I was 10 years old, and I knew all about these things already. It wasn't the first time that gun had gone off in the house. This was my mother shooting my stepfather. These childhood experiences form the foundation of what would become my life's work. Viewed in cinematic terms, the film would cut quickly from scene to scene. Trying unsuccessfully to stop one of my mother's husbands from hitting her would cut to me training hundreds of New York City police detectives in ways to evaluate domestic violence situations. Running at 11 years old alongside a limousine, clamoring with other fans to get a glimpse of the famous movie stars Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton would cut to me eight years later working for the famous couple. I will faithfully execute the office. Watching President Kennedy's inauguration on television would cut to me standing with a president and with other presidents after that. Watching in shock the reports of Senator Robert Kennedy's murder would cut to me developing the Mosaic assessment system now used to help screen threats to U.S. senators. My childhood wasn't a movie, of course, the plot didn't make much sense to me as a boy, but it does now. My ghosts had become my teachers. It turns out I was attending an academy of sorts. Above all, living with fear as a child would lead to me helping others manage fear. Today we're going to focus on intuition. I want to start with a story from the book, and that's the story of Kelly. She was coming back from shopping. As she climbed the few steps to the apartment building door, she saw that it had been left unlatched. Again, her neighbors just don't get it, she thought, because so many times she'd told her neighbors about remembering to lock this door and keep it locked. And she pushed it closed behind her, and she's absolutely certain that she closed and locked it because she heard it latch. She went up the stairs, cat food began to roll down the stairs, and she saw it go and turn the corner and roll down another set of stairs. And she heard somebody call out from down below. Got it. I'll bring it up. Right away, she, just hearing the voice, she didn't feel that it was all all right. Something felt wrong to her. But this friendly looking man came around the corner and he was gathering up cans of cat food and seemed to want nothing more than to be helpful. Hey, <laughs> let me give you a hand. Oh no, thank you, <laughs> I've got it. Really? Mm -hmm. Because uh, it doesn't look like you got it. What floor are you going to? Uh, the fourth, but uh, I'm fine, oh, really. <laughs> I'm going to the fourth floor too. And I'm late, uh, not my fault though, broken watch. Well, hey, let's not just stand here. Here, give me this. Oh, no, 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 please, uh, thank you. I've, I've got it. There is such a thing as being too proud, you know? <laughs> well, let's hurry. We've got a hungry cat up there. Hey, did you know that a cat can live for three weeks without eating? Hmm? And then finally they are at the door to her apartment. All right. I'll take it from here. Oh, no, I didn't come this far to let you have another cat food, so. <laughs> come on, please. Look, we can leave the door open like ladies in old movies. I'll just put this stuff down and then I'll go. I promise. She did let him in to put the stuff down, but he did not keep his promise. 
She told me about the three-hour rape ordeal that she went through. After the rape was over, he said to her, Hey, don't look so scared. I'm going to go to the kitchen and get something to drink. I'm not going to hurt you, I promise. But you stay right where you are. You know I won't move. She immediately took the sheet off the bed, and as he walked out into the hallway to go down toward the kitchen, she walked right down the hallway with him. She said, I was like a ghost moving down that hallway. If I had breathed, he would have felt my breath on the back of his neck, but I didn't breathe. And as he went into the kitchen, she went through the living room and out through the front door. And she went into her neighbor's apartment across the hall, which she was absolutely certain would be unlocked. And later on, she said to me, you know, how did I know that he absolutely was going to come back from the kitchen and kill me? And so she thought about it, and I remember her looking off into the distance and seeing that experience, and I said, tell me again. <laughs> she said he stood up from the bed, and then he was getting dressed, and he closed the window, and she stopped and she said, ah, that's how I know, he closed the window. He closed the window because he was concerned about making noise when he harmed me. In that decision that she made, that extraordinary decision to follow him down the hall, to basically move toward the person who might be dangerous to her, to follow her intuition, in that decision, she saved her life. There are many messengers that our intuition uses to get our attention. Nagging feelings, uh, persistent thoughts. And at the end of all of those, the big messenger is fear. The one that intuition sends when it does not want to negotiate, when it doesn't want you to delay, when it wants action right now, it wants your immediate attention. And nothing gets people's attention like true fear. True fear is quite a bit different from uh, anxiety and worry. Uh, which those are things that happen over time. But true fear is a very rapid signal. <gasps> you get that kind of feeling, and that is the one that the organism is never meant to reject or suppress. One of the things I love about Gavin's work is that he helps women distinguish the difference between worry, which is this persistent, niggling, constant hesitation and fear, as opposed to real fear, which is completely a gift. Gavin, in the sense of like worry or fear, like the startle or the dry mouth or the heartbeat and that sort of thing, is that true fear? Remember, true fear is a signal that is meant to be brief in the presence of danger. When you get true fear, there are a whole lot of uh, chemicals that are released into your body that are enormously helpful. One of them is the one we all know about, which is adrenaline, and so you get more energy. Another that's not so famous is called cortisol, and cortisol helps the blood clot more quickly in the event that you're cut. The body is actually getting ready for the possibility of being cut. And the uh, muscles fill up with lactic acid and actually get bigger, actually become a kind of armor, and uh, blood is pumped to the muscles in your arms and legs for running or for fighting. True fear is empowering, there's no question. The strategy it applies might be uh, not moving, in other words, freezing, but actual paralysis is fairly rare in true fear. A little bit like in the Kelly situation, she felt true fear at that moment, and fear said to her, shut up and do exactly what I tell you to do and I'll get you out of here. She said it was as if an animal inside her had uncoiled and used the muscles in her legs to carry her down that hallway. Basically, it took over. Now, some people get elevated heart rate from anxiety and can have anxiety attacks and what have you, and we know that's a different thing than true fear. But if people feel fear when there is no reason to, that chemical cortisol is toxic. It's not a good way to live. You can't stay in that state all the time. Unwarranted fear, like anxiety, worry, and all of those, uh, they are 
sustained feelings, they're destructive, they're counterproductive, they're bad for you. The test always is, is there something in my environment that I'm sensing right now? For me, I had a lot of fears and phobias and those kinds of things. And so to be able to distinguish between the two um, is really important for me. My premise is that you can absolutely predict human behavior. We get the signals all the time. We tend to deny them. That's the challenge. We cross-examine our own intuition. You can say, oh, I don't want to be that kind of person. I don't think so. I don't want that to be true. It doesn't seem like it is. That's the cross-examination of intuition. We, we can rationalize our way into and out of anything. And, and so the intellectual dynamic that says, oh, People don't really act like that. There's nobody that's gonna hurt me. We deny our way into harm and death. You have to listen to your intuition. I have a rule with myself that if I hear myself say, I'm sure it was nothing, that's my point to get to safety. Don't ask questions. That's a red flag. You know, when there's a bee in your hair, you don't say, oh, that might be a bee in my hair. You've already done this before you even have the conscious thought. We see a snake, snake! We don't pause to process it. We jump out of the way and then we process it. That's a survival response. It is there to say, pay attention, ready, take action. It's sort of like a crying baby. The sound is so aversive and unpleasant that we always go and respond to the crying baby. I may be speaking just as a man in that circumstance, but I, I don't think anybody likes that sound a lot. Fear has this built-in energy behind it that says change this situation right away. Imagine a gazelle in Africa, and it hears a sound that causes it fear. You cannot imagine that animal saying, oh, it's probably nothing. <laughs> Likewise, you cannot imagine that animal looking at its predator, a lion, and saying, but this is a nice lion. <laughs> so in nature, it's all very easily set up in that the predators look like this, they wear the lion suit, but with human beings, Predators spend a lot of their time and energy wearing a different suit, trying to present themselves as something that they are not. A person who intends you no harm, a person who'd be good to date, a person who you can accept help from in public, a person who you can enter into a conversation with even though you don't want to. The interesting thing with human beings is that we are not the favored prey of anything on Earth. There's not a single animal going around saying, I just can't wait to get me some human. <laughs> and why? because we're bony, because we're dangerous, and because we're smart. So there's not one animal for whom we are the favored prey. Having beaten down every other animal in nature through evolution, now humans prey on each other. And they also send signals before attacking. Kelly explained to me after the rape ordeal, when we were discussing all the details of how she was persuaded to admit him to the apartment, even though she felt so strongly that she shouldn't do it. She said that the details came so quickly that she wasn't really able to stay focused on the feelings she was having. And later when we talked about all the details, it was clear that the very fact that someone was there was the pre-incident indicator to her that there was a problem because she had latched the door fully that meant he was already inside because otherwise she would have heard the door open and she would have heard the loud buzzer and she would have heard him coming up the stairs. She didn't hear any of that. What she heard was a person in an environment where he really couldn't be if all had been normal, somebody who had been hiding in that environment. And then we went over the things that he had said and done. Got it. I'll bring it up. Hey. Uh, hi. Let me give you a hand. The key to this one is to think of charm as being a choice someone makes. He is charming me. Never a noun, always a verb. So when I hear someone say, hey, what did you think of that guy? And they say, oh, he was really charming. I like to say, you mean he was really charming you. Let me give you a hand. Charm and niceness is a persuasion feature. It's a choice that someone uses 
in order to get a particular result. There's nothing wrong with being a charming person. There's nothing wrong with being a nice person. There's only an important question, which is why. Right? A typical reason for a man being charming or nice with a woman is that he wants to date her. But in the context of I'm alone in a corridor with someone I'm already uncomfortable with, then charm and niceness is an important signal that we can register and ask the question, why is this person seeking to charm me? Why is this person using niceness as a strategy? Hey, what floor are you going to? The fourth. Well, I'm going to the fourth too. And I'm late. So let's not just stand here. Come on, give me that. The next signal is called loan sharking, which is basically putting someone in your debt, doing something for someone that they didn't ask for so that now the person feels that you owe them something. And the fact that you owe a person something makes it hard to ask him to leave you alone. The defense for loan sharking is to remember two things that are very easy to forget, and that is he approached me and I didn't ask for any help. Well, let's not just stand here. Come on, give me that. No, no, really, thank you, but no, I, I've got it. There's such a thing as being too proud, you know? And that's called typecasting. It's a little mild insult that then the targeted person wants to prove isn't true. Typecasting is a way of getting you to engage. The defense for typecasting is acting as if you never heard the words at all. So if someone says you're probably too snobbish to give a guy a ride in your car, it's literally to not hear it at all. As opposed to taking it on board and saying, well, am I a snob? Now I have to prove to this person that I'm not. There is such a thing as being too proud, you know? Kelly resisted the label by accepting the help. Come on, we better hurry. We got a hungry cat up there. Well, that's a thing called forced teaming. Forced teaming is making someone feel like you and she are in the same circumstance. It's like reaching a taxi on a rainy day and you say, oh, gee, we're both caught on this rainy day. But they really had nothing in common. And he tried to force something in common. We're both late. We both like cats. In fact, she could have said, we're not both late. You might be late and I might have a challenge with these cat food cans, but we are not sharing an experience here. Did you know he used catchy details to be perceived as somebody who she knew, somebody she could be comfortable with. Too many details. The con man will throw down a whole bunch of tacks on the highway to flatten your tires. Look over here while something's happening over here, just like a magician. Because the problem when people are being dishonest is even though what they are saying might sound credible to the person they're tricking, it doesn't sound credible to them. So they keep adding details, they keep talking. And when they do that, it's this wonderful indicator of why would you assume that I'm not trusting you right now? And the defense for too many details is always remembering context. I'm in a corridor in my building with a person I don't know and he's trying to help me even though I'm saying no. I asked Kelly to go back and think about the moment when she was standing at the door with him in the open doorway. I'll just put this down and then I'll go. I promise. That's called an unsolicited promise. When you feel skepticism about somebody, they will see that you feel skepticism. And that's why a person adds, I promise. People who have credibility never have to make an unsolicited promise. It's different if you ask somebody to promise you something. But when somebody makes an unsolicited promise, like I'll be on time at the airport, I promise. I'll have the car back by 10 o'clock, Dad, I promise. <laughs> it's a great gift to us. It's like a mirror that's held up to us, and we can look in that mirror and see ourselves doubting someone. And to me, the correct response is to say, at least in your own head, thank you for pointing that out to me. I do doubt you, and I must have some reason for it. No, thank you. No, 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 thank you. No, honestly, really, no, I've got it. In the Kelly situation, he refused to hear the word no, and she let go of the bag.
in that moment he became aware that she would not hold her ground. And with strangers, even the ones with the best intentions, never ever relent on the issue of no. It's not just annoying, it's a real important indicator. Anybody who doesn't hear the word no is trying to control you. And if you let someone talk you out of the word no, you might as well wear a sign that says, you're in charge. A good saying for all of us to remember is that no is a complete sentence. It doesn't need any additional information attached to it. Gavin makes this observation. In our culture, in many cultures, when a man says no... It is the end of a discussion, and when a woman in the culture says no... It's the beginning of a negotiation. It's a different world for men and women in that regard. And for all of us now, an important lesson is that when we say no and someone ignores it, what we're actually wise to do is amp up the level of our no. No! Back up! Now, a lot of people are hesitant about that because of the concern about appearing rude. I don't want to hurt his feelings. Well, a lot of the times when we say that to ourselves, we're never even gonna see that person again. If you're wrong and the person doesn't have some sinister intent, then okay. Yeah. That doesn't make any difference. No, and the worst thing that you've done is offend somebody, and I think so many women are trained that the worst thing they can do is offend somebody. I think women walk through the world feeling fear of offending, fear of not fitting into our social environment, looking like a bitch, which is something you and I have talked about. And what is the acronym you have for bitch? Bitch is, boys, I'm taking control here. It makes me so happy. I think mm. about it all the time. Mm. You know what? You know, if a stranger comes up to me and says something and I yell at them, I'm not worried about what they think about me because if they don't mean me any harm, they're going to understand. I have never in my entire career encountered a criminal attack that occurred because a woman was rude. However, I've encountered hundreds of criminal attacks and studied them closely that occurred because a woman allowed somebody she was uncomfortable about to stay in her environment meaning she got engaged in a conversation. The overwhelming number of encounters we all have are not dangerous, right? The overwhelming number of people we meet in our lives do nothing sinister and have no negative intent for us. Most of the time, right now, for example, none of us feel any danger, but when we feel it, that's when it's so critically important to listen to it because that signal that we get, that gift from intuition, sometimes the gift of fear, is there for a reason. It's there to tell us, all right, stop and ask a question. Why do I feel that way? What's going on? In nature, we hear a lot about animals have the uh, fight or flight response. People say that human beings have the same thing, fight or flight. It's my premise that human beings have many, many more options. We have fight. We have flight, which is run away. We have negotiate. We have pretend to give in and then fight. We have fight and then give in later on. We have trickery. We have the ability to bring all kinds of resources to the table that animals don't have. Because remember, no claws, no good teeth, although you can use them in the right kind of emergency. I wouldn't discount them. But the main thing we have is our intuitive ability, this real nuclear defense system that allows us to get out of victimization if we don't debate with it, if we don't argue with it. I remember a story about a woman who took her daughter out to a movie every Friday night with a group of other mothers and their daughters. Her daughter was seven, and uh, in this particular one, they were going to see Jurassic Park. And as they were standing in line to buy the tickets, there was a man in line behind her who had a, uh, a T-shirt on and it said, afraid of the dark on it. And she felt that he was looking at her. And then at one point, their eyes met, and he said, uh, ladies' night out, because he could see all the women with all their kids. And she sort of said, uh-huh, and didn't really engage with him. And then they saw the movie about uh, predators in ancient times, came out of the movie, and it was dark. And she'd parked some blocks away. So one of her friends said, hey, do you want to get a ride with us? And uh, at that moment, her daughter wanted to go to the bathroom, and she said, no, you guys go ahead. But the moment she said, you guys go ahead, she had a strong wish that she hadn't said that. And she was concerned about that man. He was gone. The movie theater was almost empty when they left. And so they walked down the street to head back toward her car. And uh, she had a strong feeling that they were being followed. She turned around and indeed the man was following her. 
And so she took her daughter, Kate, by the hand and she said, let's walk a little faster. And they walked faster. And she decided she didn't want to run because if she ran, she felt she couldn't run faster than this man could run, particularly not with Kate. So she was planning what she would do when she got to her car. And she decided she would unlock the door on the passenger side first, put her daughter in and lock that door and then go around to the other side. And that's just what she did. And as she got to the other side, he was on the car already and he was trying to unlock the door that her daughter was on that side, but it was locked. And she heard it once, twice, and they looked at each other across the top of the car. And his look was, you are my victim. And hers was, no, I am not. And she started to get in the car and she realized she wouldn't be able to get in before he'd made it all the way around and he had hold of her legs. And she was kicking her legs in the car. She had the car key to put into the ignition and she suddenly got the impulse key. And she thought, well, I don't want to be the kind of person who sticks a key in somebody's eye. She started the car and the next thing she heard was the door slamming. She had accelerated away from there. She had already stuck him in the eye while she was thinking about it. <laughs> and at that moment, she thought to herself, well, at least I didn't stick him in both eyes. And then she realized she had done that. <laughs> and so he was sitting on the sidewalk doing what men do if you stick a car key in their eyes. And uh, the next thing she heard was her daughter saying, uh, Mama, you didn't put on your seatbelt. And so her daughter was completely unaffected by the circumstance. And when I interviewed her later, I said, did you feel sorry for him? Did you feel bad? And she said, no, that's the consequence you get if you bother a mother who's with her child. <laughs> she said, it's just natural. And all of what she experienced really had been natural. The wild brain, as opposed to the logical brain, doesn't care what you think, doesn't care what you say to yourself. It just cares about what you do. And she had done the entire thing before she even realized she'd done it. And she'd prevailed and she was perfectly fine. Very few women have had any kind of contact sport. So they don't have a direct experience of the humanity of men. That men are flesh and blood. Oh, they're just like I am. Those eyeballs are just as vulnerable as a woman's eyeballs. I get it. Often with victims after the fact, they are criticized. It's a very common thing you'll hear, that someone will say, I know this was a giant mistake. This next thing I did, you'll probably tell me I was stupid to do it. And I never do that. Because the fact is, they prevailed. If they're here to tell me about it, they obviously weren't killed, they were not destroyed, and they prevailed with exactly the strategy that was right for them in that circumstance. What do you have to say to the proverbial saying, there's nothing in life to fear but fear itself? I say there's nothing to fear until and unless you feel fear. What I'm certain of is that ignoring the reality of the situation is not a viable precaution. That won't make anybody safer. And so it's worthwhile to know what predators' behaviors are, know what the pre-incident indicators are of violence, and then be able to set it aside and certainly not live in fear. For me, just being able to trust that intuition so that you don't live in fear and that you are aware and ready to deal with the situation when it comes up, that's the most important thing. We can listen to that intuition that tells us we're not safe at that moment or we may be in danger and go with it and not care if anyone thinks you're rude or run down the street. No, who cares if anybody thinks you're crazy? If you're safe at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter.